Welcome back to Close Up. John Hickenlooper is one of the few 2020 candidates to have led one of the 50 states. But so far, it's been a tough slog as the former two-term governor of Colorado has just had to reset his campaign. John Hickenlooper is our guest this morning. Good to see you. Thanks for get, uh, joining us here, Governor. Of course. Thanks for having me. So the reports uh, had some advisors telling you to drop out of this race and run for Senate. Why stick it out on the 2020 presidential campaign trail? Well, because I, th I still feel that I am unique among the, all the candidates. Uh, you know, what we did in Colorado, we brought businesses and nonprofits together. We brought Democrats and Republicans. We got to near universal health care coverage. Uh, we passed, you know, universal background checks and, and other reasonable gun laws. And most importantly, we became the number one economy for three consecutive years in a row and an economy where, where really everyone was getting to share in the prosperity. I think I'm the one person who's done what everyone else is, is just talking about. And I want to make sure voters get a chance to, you know, once they begin to pay attention, that they have that choice. You don't need much money to campaign in New Hampshire at all. That's the beauty of it here. Uh, but you do need money to campaign nationally. Only about a million dollars brought in in the last quarter. What's your plan to persist uh, on a lower budget? Well, I think I need to keep raising money. And, and if you're not a U.S. senator, it's infinitely harder to get small dollar donors and even to get to large dollar donors if, you know, Senators have all kinds of advantages in raising money, but I accept that. I knew that going in. My goal is to keep pushing in Iowa and New Hampshire, and maybe a little bit in Nevada and South Carolina. But if I can move the needle in New Hampshire, if I can move the needle in Iowa, then all of a sudden the, the mainstream media begins to pay attention. And once they pay attention, suddenly if I move up in the polls, then it becomes e easier for a, a governor, someone who's actually done what everyone else is talking about, it becomes easier for me to raise money. You were in Iowa last month giving a speech and you said socialism is not the answer and they booed you. Did you feel like you were in a parallel universe there? <laughs> well, you know, I, I look at, you know, again, what we did in Colorado, we got the near universal health care coverage, but we did not go out and tell people they had to give up their private insurance, right? And, and Medicare for all would require 180 million Americans to give up their private insurance. And I realize some people hate their private insurance. Uh, but you're not going to convince 180 million people to give up something that many of them like. So we push real hard to have a public option and let people have the choice of migrating towards a Medicare or Medicare Advantage hybrid, uh, but not forcing them. And when I, when I spoke out against some of these big expansions of government, uh, you know, I used the word socialism, I got booed because I wasn't liberal enough. I think America, in New Hampshire, in Iowa, all across this country, they want pragmatic solutions. They want big progressive goals, right? We got to near universal health care coverage in Colorado, but we didn't have a big expansion of government. We got to, to, you know, attack climate change. We got the oil and gas industry to work with the environmental community and address methane, one of the worst pollutants there is. We created methane regulations for the first time in this country, but we didn't do it with a massive expansion of government. We, we did it by work, getting everyone to work together. You often talk about making sure this is a big tent party for the Democrats, but do Democratic Socialists belong in the Democratic Party or should they strike out on their own? No, I think it is a big tent. And I, you know, I have great respect for Senator Sanders and many of the issues he raised in, in 2016 and before, he brought great clarity to, you know, to these issues that are now being talked about on a regular basis, student debt. Right. What are we going to do about student debt? Uh, uh, universal health care. How do we actually get to the point where health care is a right and not a privilege? He brought clarity. I disagree with Medicare for all, but it doesn't mean I don't respect the, the, the power of his voice and what it does to the debate. And I just want to be part of that debate to say, hey, socialism is not the answer. America was built. I tell people that this country was built on the work of individuals, but it was built on the work of individuals working together. And that's the model in Colorado. That's the model I want to take to the country, getting people to work together to address climate change and health care and, you know, uh, make sure that we have jobs for everyone. What is it that socialists don't get about entrepreneurship, do you think? Well, it's hard to say. I, I tried to take my experience as a, a restaurant owner, a brew pub owner, uh, basically a small business owner and entrepreneur. I want to take that systems approach to, to being mayor and being governor. And I think that if you think about it, an entrepreneur has to put a team together, has to motivate and, 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 and hold accountable that team to achieve whatever vision and goals they agree to. I mean, that's what government should be doing. And I look at 
too often the, the, the failures of government, the places we don't succeed, we didn't create a business plan. We didn't look at what is the risk versus reward when we make an investment of, of capital, right? Tax money uh, or social capital, people's work time. Uh, we need, I think, to have more of that small business background injected into how we solve the big problems facing this country. And yet you're getting booed for that. Yeah, sometimes. Not often. I mean, certainly I haven't been booed in, in, in New Hampshire, and I haven't been booed in, in Iowa. Uh, that was California, and that's a pretty liberal state. Okay. Um, Fifty years ago, the United States put men on the moon. Uh, this last week, we've been locked in a bitter debate about whether the president's tweets are racist. Uh, it's hard to imagine the kind of unity of purpose that existed back then existing now, and, and hard to imagine this country putting a man on the moon again. Why is that? Well, and I... I think of it in this sense. We are in a national crisis of division. And this is way before Trump ever got involved seriously in politics. I mean, it goes back three or four, maybe even five decades. And part of it is the media and, and how we've changed. We now have news channels that are all conservative or all liberal. People don't get a balanced perspective all the time. It's been exaggerated by social media like Facebook, where the haters can kind of take, take root and really twist the, the dialogue, tweet, uh, Twitter, and the, and the tweets that people make uh, are so often one-sided and, and filled with venom. I think that the key to this next election is whoever the candidate is has to be committed to, after the election, assuming they can defeat Donald Trump, how do we bring this country together? How do we get Republicans to work with Democrats? And, and, and how do we get business to work with nonprofits and, and with, with foundations and universities to address things like climate change? We're never going to succeed in addressing climate change if we don't have everyone working together. You've got a new immigration plan out. You want to give visas, essentially, to the folks who are undocumented in this country. I mean, Ten years, is that correct? Yeah. And how would that kind of blanket visa amnesty, if you will, not create another sort of human wave of people trying to get across the border to get those well, visas. Well, what I say is that's got to be part of a comprehensive uh, reform. So the first thing we have to do is go to the southern border and, and deal with the humanitarian nightmare, the train wreck that's there now. And, and obviously that will take significant investments. Simultaneously, we have to go back down to what they call the northern triangle countries of El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala. And, and as we did up until four years ago, really invest into those economies. It doesn't take a lot of money to make conditions better there so we're not generating all these refugees, people seeking asylum. Uh, but the third thing I said is comprehensive reform. So it's an, an ID system that works. It's securing the border. We don't need a wall, but we do, borders matter. We need a border. We, I think we need, uh, again, to take everyone who's here working right now and without documentation, we have to make sure that they uh, have a 10-year visa and, and, and have, are able to get additions if they need it. And since they've broken the law to be here, they, there should be some penalty. They don't just get to immediately go in line to become a citizen. Eventually, they'll have that opportunity. But the last thing is we have to hold businesses accountable. In other words, all the, the attraction for so many people is that they can get paid under the table. And that's un-American. I met people when I was running for re-election in Colorado that had had businesses, they'd been entrepreneurs for decades, and they wouldn't pay under the table, and therefore they couldn't compete, and they went out of business. And that's the fourth part. We've got to increase the penalties for businesses and knowingly hire people illegally. There should be consequences. If we dry up that source of, 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 of income, people aren't going to come flocking to our country because they won't be able to find those jobs. The jobs will be regulated based on the number of visas and the number of people that are here. And just for the record, right now, we have 7.5 million people, uh, or a million jobs, 7.5 million unfilled jobs, and only 6.3, 6.4 million people looking. So we can't afford to send a million, or let's say 10 or 11 million, but certainly not even 1 million people away from this country, because we need workers. In Colorado, you were a moderate who was interesting enough to win. When are we going to see the John Hickenlooper of those commercials, you know, showering in a suit? <laughs> Is that something you can do to kind of, you know, grab that old strategy and create a spark here? Well, we want to really focus on making sure people know my record, that I'm the one person who's done what everyone else is just talking about. We've got to near universal health care. We've got to create the number one economy for the last three years. You know, we want that record to be known. But then now that we've kind of gotten that out there, we might begin looking at a little more playful approach, a more playful approach in terms of letting people 
really understand who I am. All right. Governor Hickelooper, thanks for joining us on Close Good to see you. We appreciate the time.